Hello my friends, this is the 92nd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. This is my beautiful wife, Julia, joining me today. So when I came back from uh, the break for Patterson in Pursuit, I said that eventually I was gonna talk about some of the medical issues that we had been having. And uh, it's been a long time coming. It's a very long story, but we finally are putting enough pieces of the puzzle together where I wanna share with you guys what's been going on because I imagine there's lots of people out there with health issues, um, maybe unknown health issues, maybe chronic unknown health issues that we, like we have had for many years. And we might be able to uh, help with sharing the story, what we're going through and the treatment that we're now on and start to make some improvements. So we have a, a bit of an outline for the stuff we wanna talk about. Um, it's gonna be a bit impromptu so bear with us, but hopefully you'll find this helpful. A good place to start is to say that for the past six years, we have had a bad illness, which has progressively gotten worse um, to the point where um, a few years ago, you know, we had to stop our travels. We were traveling around and had to stop and come back to the States because um, traveling made the symptoms a lot worse. And then just recently, I guess last July, uh, it got really, really bad where I had, I had to stop everything I was doing. I couldn't work. Um, Ju Julia went to the ER, had some heart issues, which we'll talk about. It was pretty scary and pretty intense. And since then, Julia has done a massive amount of research, figuring shit out. And um, now, like I said before, now we're recovering. But for a while there, it was, it was pretty scary, it was pretty ugly, and we've been pretty private about it because we didn't exactly know what the heck was going on. But I think we can, um, we can now share a little bit more. So over the past six years, Julia and I have seen literally over 50, 5 zero, 50 doctors in uh, multiple states, even a few different countries. And out of those 50 doctors, it's been a bunch of different specialists, probably five, 10 different types of specialists. Nobody was able to correctly figure out and diagnose what the heck was going on. Um, and that, I think that's, in hindsight now, I, I understand why, because we've learned about the, the state of the Western medical establishment, but at the time it was incredibly, incredibly disheartening and expensive to keep going from place to place to place to place to place to 50 places and still not figure out what the heck was going on. So a big part of this story is, I think, the failure of the mainstream medical establishment. Just like in the world of ideas, uh, I think the orthodoxy, orthodox consensus about everything from interpretations of quantum mechanics to the philosophy and foundations of uh, mathematics post Cantor to um, the bas basic economics, I don't think the mainstream gets it right. And in this case, I think sometimes they may, the Western establishment may be doing actual harm to people as we, as we discovered. So um, I guess the last note of preface is also throughout this, we have both seen how important philosophy is, where in trying to piece together pieces of the puzzle, there are methods of reasoning which are inferior and superior and you can see and when you actually analyze some of the studies we're looking at and some of the lectures and some of the methodology of where uh, mainstream health orthodoxy comes from the there's not a lot of intellectual rigor i'd like to assume there was i had faith that there was intellectual rigor prior to investigation but um, there's a shocking staggering unfathomable lack of intellectual rigor. And we have got some pretty good examples of that, not just personally, but also um, in some other things that Julia has been researching. Okay, so that's the preface. Want me to start the story or you wanna start the story? Um, what happened? Yeah, you start the story. Okay, so we got uh, sick uh, all the way back in our honeymoon. We had a, a a wonderful engagement, we had a wonderful relationship, everything was great and rosy, and then bam, got a, a really nasty infection on our honeymoon, a pelvic infection. You got a pelvic infection that was treated with antibiotics. Um, yeah. 
un unsuccessfully, it didn't quite go away. Very shortly after that, we came back. It started while we were on the honeymoon, but then um, right afterwards, it became really bad. I had... Um, we simultaneously got very sick. Right. We simultaneously got sick, and I suddenly got um, a kidney my kidney, top of my kidney blew out. And I, from whatever happened, whatever infection I and we had, I don't know if that caused the kidney to blow out, I'm not sure, but it turns out I, have, I had a congenital defect where my ureter was wrapped around my artery. Um, and so for some reason, something got pinched or whatever, and it backed up the top of my kidney, a kidney blew out, had to get surgery. Um, I think it was probably just the inflammation that really set it off finally. Yes, it, it could have been. I'm not exactly sure the cause, mm. but after that, so she, she had an infection that, that didn't, didn't fully go away. I got this infection, and then I had to get the surgery. I had a, a stent put in, which is a, a little tube in my ureter to keep the urine flow uh, smooth or whatever. When they took that out, I got an incredibly bad infection. Um, just like it had to go to the ER to get IV antibiotics, Horrible, horrible pain, epididymitis. Um, that also, in the short term, you know, the getting the antibiotics made the extreme crippling pain go away. But after that point, there were persistent symptoms that never went away. Mm -hmm. but that was the beginning of it. Yeah, and um, for I think for you, it was considered like more abnormal. Like there was a lot of doctors that were like, "Oh, this is very." Um, intriguing and kind of confusing. You're a young guy. For me, um, I think a lot of people, apparently um, women, uh, often get pelvic infections on honeymoons. This is a common thing, or UTIs, or some um, urogenital issues on honeymoons. And my problems were kind of looked at as small in comparison and and they were in some sense um, but seen as very trivial and that they would be over and minimized quite a, quite a bit yeah so that setting what our expectation was this was going to be a short yeah. oh this was unfortunate mm -hmm. this is a short-lived thing and we're just gonna have smooth sailing from here on Right, and I think a lot of people have that idea as oh you get an infection you take some antibiotics it's over you forget about it and you move on. Yeah. But when that doesn't happen and when the problems don't go away, then uh, things get really bad. Yeah. So all of this was happening when we were living in upstate New York. And, at, and while we were there, Julia was in school and it was kind of middle of nowhere upstate New York where the healthcare quality was not great. But even then we saw, I mean, between the two of us, we saw a ton of people. We saw every, everybody from OBGYNs to prostate doctors and urologists to general practitioners, got antifungal, fungals, antibiotics. Um, we had persistent problems, per persistent reproductive system problems that wouldn't go away. And for me, um, a lot of that was manifest, I think, in my prostate, or that was one area where it, apparently this is a, a problem that men get, is it's really hard to kick infections out of the prostate. So. Um, one funny story, I might as well, uh, on that topic, to demonstrate the insanity of some of the people in the medical establishment. So <clears throat> shortly after I had my stent removed and I got this horrible infection and then I started having these prostate problems, um, I did a little research, figured out, okay, this is, it's likely going to be um, uh, prostate, I got to figure it out. I'm going to go into the it's the same people. I think it was the same people that did the surgery, did the the yeah. initial exam. And you and it was text. It was like textbook prostate. Textbook. Yeah. Yes, and so uh, so at, this is this is when we were still very naive, a little frustrated at the medical establishment, a little naive and how bad things were. So I go to the doctor's office, and the it was a lady. It wasn't the the main doctor. It was a, a nurse, it was one of the second in command people. And tell her what's going on. And she said, Well, you know, you look healthy. He said, And you're very young. Yeah, it's probably not young. prostatitis. Yeah. You know, it's, it, you, you look healthy. I said, okay, well, I'm having all these symptoms. She said, Okay, well, I guess we'll do a prostate exam. And, you know, we'll see. We'll try to diagnose if, it's, if, it, if that's what it is. So, <clears throat> little graphic, but if you can a prostate exam, finger up the butt and they do this little back and forth motion. 
it was excruciating for me. I, I literally remember like I, I, the way I was sitting down, I had my hands like on the wall, up against the wall and, I, and, my, and my fingers like curled into the wall. It was so painful. I was not, I, And I you never, have a very high pain tolerance as well. Well, you think I have a high pain tolerance. I don't know if I do or not, but. <laughs> you I, do. I, I have a, I don't <laughs> Nothing, know. Nothing, you don't even say anything's bothering you until it's after <laughs> like past a six. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so I'm in a lot of pain and I had never experienced that before. And I was like, oh, well, obviously something's there. So she, st she stops the exam and she goes, oh yeah, no, I don't think it's prostatitis. Well, she, it, she even said, oh, it is kind of large, but maybe you just have a large yeah, prostate. It, 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 yes, and I said, well, w w wouldn't it fit with the symptoms? And she said, no, if, if you had prostatitis, it, you'd be a lot more sensitive. You'd be a lot more tender when I did the exam. And I was like, lady that was her. incredibly painful like incredibly painful she's like yeah no i, I it, it's very very unlikely for somebody your age you know it's it's something else blah 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 so i was like good heavens this See? is high pain tolerance you fooled her yeah i get i don't think i probably squealed when she did it <laughs> but, uh. so that was that was one representative case of these doctors had in mind for years that if you if you don't look sick yeah. and you're young and your symptoms are non-standard, then you're not sick. This has um, been brought up multiple times throughout many years that we do not look sick. Um, I've been told I look healthy, that I'm young. You've been told same similar things. And I often wonder, well, what does a sick person look like? I know. You know, like... I can't tell somebody has cancer just by looking at them. Um, I mean, I guess eventually you'll be able to tell somebody's sick, but, you know, they were sick before they, you know, are gaunt and have big dark circles yes. under their eyes. I mean, people are sick way before that stage. So it just does, it doesn't even make sense to me, that concept of you don't look sick. Very few people who are sick, people with autoimmune diseases don't look sick. Yes, and, and we were being told this at a time where our symptoms were stupendously obvious um uh, we won't, eventually we'll uh, we've got a list of the ones that uh, we'll share but one of them one of the biggest ones is the fatigue extreme fatigue like sleep 12 hours a day you can only do one one thing per day and then you're totally gassed for the day but we're we're in our uh, at that time early 20s mid 20s and because we don't look sick, though we have all of these very big side effects, they say, ah, well, yeah, it's, maybe it's something that's in your head. Yeah. So it's something, that's an, another recurring theme that I'm sure other people have struggled with. Um, and it's dismissal. It's the, the doctors have a very small, as Tom Woods might say, the three by five card of allowable <laughs> illness, medical illness. And if you, and if they're understanding uh, is insufficient, so they don't um, they they don't know what's wrong with you. They literally will conclude, oh, well, you must not be sick. Or it's psychiatric. Yeah, or it's psychiatric. Instead of thinking, well, maybe maybe I don't know what's going on. It's oh, well, because I don't know what's going on, therefore it's in your head, which is elementary. That's an elementary mistake, ph philosophic mistake, especially when you're talking about literally the most complex system in the known universe, which is the human body. The human brain is the most complex little piece of, you know, three pound piece of matter, but the brain is just one little, well, not one, it's one big variable in this fantastically complex system that we have. We don't understand, we don't understand the basics of digestion, much less complex chronic infection. Um, and yet they conclude, well, if I don't understand it, even though you're reporting all of these symptoms, you must not be sick. And, and I will say too, I have noticed from the outside that I think the um, frequency of dismissal of symptoms is more common with female patients than with male patients because I have seen it firsthand that Julia does not get treated with the same amount of respect and severity that I get treated with. Yeah, that, um, I don't feel like sexism is something I've had to deal with for the most part in my life. Um, but this is definitely one area where I felt completely dismissed and um, 
was even, you know, suggested by a couple of doctors that, you know, I was young and married and maybe this was a very stressful time for me. And, you know, it was very abnormal in upstate New York um, to, to be a college student um, and at a liberal arts school and be married at 19. And um, I was just treated like a very impressionable young idiot. Um, and that was really frustrating for me. And this whole process has been really frustrating, but that um, has been a very mm, ugly side of it. And I would also say, um, as a side note, that the probably the most um, harsh comments um, that felt derived from my gender were from women, from women doctors. Uh, so I, I just find that interesting. It is interesting. And... And I don't really see that in many other places of life, but there really does seem to be a double standard. And, and maybe it's the case, like, look, I, I'm politically incorrect. <clears throat> I, I do think that women tend to be more emotional than men. I think that's for biological, uh, hormonal reasons. Yes, I do think that's true. So I think what happens is maybe doctors see that trend and then they run with it. And then they go, well, therefore, if I don't understand exactly what's going on in the system and it's a woman, well, chances are she's just being emotional or, or she's just on her, she's just PMSing or something like that. It's like this cheap, this cheap reasoning process where you can just dismiss goodness, goodness knows how many women have had serious medical problems simply dismissed by virtue of the fact that they're women. And I think part of the problem too is that women's diseases, I think for the most part, are harder to diagnose. So this becomes kind of like a running theme with doctors that they see a bunch of women that they maybe they never follow up with. They don't know what their story turns into. So they just see a woman come in a couple of times to their office, the woman gets dismissed and leaves, and the doctor concludes she wasn't actually sick. Years down the line, she's probably diagnosed with autoimmune illnesses or exactly. a bunch of different things. And and um, I, I feel like men's diseases, for the most part, present um, a little bit more physically um, noticeably um, heart disease and, I don't know, different male diseases. Prostate, I mean, you can feel a prostate. You were ignored. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. prostate problems you can feel for the most part and different things like that. So, I don't know. I'm... You know, part of me understands it, and part of me is really angered by the whole thing. Well, and so in, in the research we've done, you've done mainly, since all of this, it is actually the case that in reality, there are lots of diseases that do affect women differently. Medica mm. it aff medication yeah. uh, affects women differently. Some of the autoimmune stuff is more common with women. So especially, yeah, so yeah, that is a... I mean, heart disease is even harder to detect in women, so it's right. just, it, it's different. It's, it's just, uh, we are more complex beings. Right. right. So you want to say the bed stat story before we go on to the next? Oh, um, yeah, so this was probably one of the worst doctors that I dealt with, and it was one of the first doctors I dealt with as well. Um, and I went into her office and told her that I had an infection. Um, and she did an exam and told me that I did not have an infection, um, but that she was going to run tests just to reassure me because she thought I was a young, married, anxious child. That, uh, that might be an, an abusive relationship. Oh, yeah. She made Steve leave the room and yeah. really questioned me on whether I was being abused. And I said, this has never happened to me before. Yeah. And she said, oh, it's policy. But I didn't see yes. that happening with policy. anybody else. So, uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, she told me straight out that I didn't have an infection completely confident and um, ran some testing and called me a few days later and said, well, you have an infection. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's just one example of many, but um, that was one of the more egregious the things that had happened to to me and and the way that she had treated me and you was really horrible so yeah and if you didn't insist on getting the tests you would have walked out of that office being misdiagnosed 
from that lady. And who knows? Well, yeah. Who knows how many circ how many women have gone to that doctor, been treated like crap, dismissed, and uh, not had their even disease diagnosed. Literally walking out of there with negative information. It's one thing to not know if something's wrong with you. It's another thing to think, well, X is not wrong with me. I don't have an infection when you do have an infection. Like better would have been just to say, I don't know. But no, yeah. she was exactly right. opposite. It would have been way better if she was just kind of agnostic about the whole thing. Yes, or, I mean, e even then, I think is giving her the benefit of the doubt because I think you kind of have to be a fool to say that you don't act, you don't have an infection. But that's another story. So after we leave New York, um, we go to Georgia. We move down to Georgia and got saw some more doctors. Um, nothing quite worked. I actually had a maybe the only really good doctor that either of us has, has had. In the, in the mainstream Western establishment as my prostate doctor in Atlanta. Was great, wasn't an idiot, and recognized that I was having prostate problems. Um, tried a bunch of different antibiotics still. Uh, to his credit, the best I have ever felt in, um, was after taking IV antibiotics for like three weeks, something like that, 20 days. And unfortunately, it didn't last, but uh, I, I felt like 10 million bucks and I was so excited because I thought, oh, finally, obviously we've had this infection. This is what I needed. I should have got this before, but sure enough, it, it slowly came back. But <clears throat> we also kind of gave up. We, we, we were really intense for doing the, going the medical establishment route. And then this was after a number of years, we kind of petered out on that for a few years because it was like, what the heck did we do? Like, who do we, who do we talk to? Yeah, it was expensive and time consuming. And when you have no energy, um, and are just, you know, we were trying to work at that time too. And um, we weren't, we weren't telling people, um, we still really hadn't told anybody until recently what, that we were struggling for so many years. And um, we were just trying to hold ourselves together. And it was really hard to do all of those appointments and, yeah, and be dismissed and exactly. spend the money and the time to try to schedule an appointment with a doctor only to find out that this is not going to be the doctor for us and right. do it again and again and again and again. It was just really exhausting. Yeah, exhausting and expensive and incredibly disheartening where we would literally be thinking, well, why am I doing this appointment? I mean, we had this conversation where it's like, yeah. why am I doing this? I know what they're going to say. I know the tests are going to come back negative. The standard test that they're going to run because they only have this little limited framework of understanding of what might be wrong. Um, because we look healthy. Um, and sure enough, that was the case over and over. It was just kind of predictable that you go in, tell them the story, well, let's run some tests, they come back negative, you get dismissed. And uh, yeah, and as, and as this process was going on, we were getting more symptoms as well. And so it was almost funny because we would get happy that we would get a new symptom because yeah. we were thinking, oh, I can tell this new symptom to the doctor and maybe they'll, they'll have like a doctor house moment where we'll right. be like, that's oh, it. Oh, you've got this. Yeah. yeah. And um, that never happened. <laughs> um, and no, the opposite. It was like, oh, well, yeah, you're, yeah, like you're the, making shit up. Right. Like the more symptoms we put on the list, the more we were told it was psychiatric, right. which was really unfortunate. But yeah. Um, in our mind, it was like, oh, we, we have all this new information to give you. and Because we thought they were reasonable. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that was kind of, that was really rough. And that lasted for six years, really. Yeah. And so there's this term that came up, I've learned about it like maybe a year or two ago, which is gaslighting. If you guys don't know what that term is, it's the idea of like, if you were trying to be really manipulative, let's say of your spouse and trying to like screw with their head, you would turn on the lights, like turn on the gas, listen the gas lights, and uh, then, you know, leave the room and then say, and then come back in and say, hey, wife, why, why'd you turn the lights on? I don't understand why you did that. And they go, well, I didn't do it. And they say, well, I didn't do it. You must have done it. And so you just kind of screw with their head. You do crap like that over and over and lie to them, I guess, for the purpose of manipul manipulating them. This is what that felt like, was gaslighting from these doctors where we'd go in and self-evident to literally to a five-year-old that we're sick when we're talking about what's been going on. And they would say, nah, 
No, you're you, you, you're not sick. It's in your head. Go you know go see a psychologist or psychiatrist or whatever. Another thing that was really interesting is that nobody would consider our illnesses connected. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Where I don't think. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't think. I think maybe your prostate doctor was like, oh yeah, yeah. Obviously, obviously, you guys have some sort of connected infection. Yep. And. Everybody else besides that was like completely unrelated. It doesn't matter that you got sick the same day and that you progressively have gotten worse and mirror each other's symptoms exactly and react positively to the same things and negatively to the same things. They're not connected. To the point yeah. that we had a infectious disease doctor oh, yeah. tell us, not even kidding, that we both came down with depression. Severe, severe psychosomatic symptoms of depression on the, on the same, same day. day. You can't make it up. And at the time, and I, and I still, I feel silly, honestly, and I, like what the heck took me so long to realize these people are idiots, many of them, not all of them. But I remember that conversation. This is the same infectious disease doctor that's, that told Julia, we've ruled out the possibility of infection. Yeah. I've at, been told that many times. As if that's a thing you can do. As if there's a list, a great list, a platonic list out there of all possible infections one can have. And if the tests, assuming the reliability of the tests are accurate, if they come up negative, well, then it is the case we've ruled out the possibility of infection. I, of course, you could have a long conversation with this, this person. Well, how, how is it the case that you come up with um, new diseases. How do new diseases get added to that list? It sure would be something like you have all these symptoms and the tests come back me negative. Maybe you have something that's not on the list. Yeah. Well, it's funny too because we were recommended to that doctor because my EKG was abnormal. Oh, was it that late? Yeah. And I remember asking him, I said, so, okay, let's just go with this theory <laughs> that Steve and I simultaneously became depressed is that going to make my heart electrical signals abnormal? Mm. And he kind of stopped and thought and said, well, maybe. Yeah. And it was just like, kind of just dismissed that. And I was like, well, I'm here because I went to the ER with stabbing chest pain and had a severely abnormal EKG. And that's why I was referred to you. And it was just like that didn't make a difference. Yeah, and he was saying, yeah, it's uh, it's in your head. So so we that, so we kind of skipped along chronologically, but but that's okay. So we're in Atlanta, failure. So uh, in the middle of all this, right around this time, we also have a bunch of family deaths. So my mother died, your father spontaneously died, uh, my father spontaneously died, two heart attacks, um, and then we had some grandparents die. So we have. You know, family tragedy going on during all of this. And around this time, this is when we started talking about traveling, where we were thinking, okay, I don't, I, neither of us know how long we're gonna live. We'd like to travel. It was looking grim. <laughs> it was looking grim, I think <laughs> we could say that. Um, why don't we get our, everybody wants to travel, but they wait till their kids leave. Why don't we travel now before we have kids and you know, get it out of the way? Um, and so we started traveling. We started they started the Patterson Pursuit um, tour um, or interview series. And, but shortly after starting, we went to Europe first. And shortly afterward, the symptoms, especially for you, got significantly worse. Very rare, very rapid decline to the point where only a few months in, you know, we would plan to be out for a few years. Only a few months in, we had to come back because you were having horrible, um, horrible symptoms. So yeah, th then we, come, we, we were able to go out um, later, but we came back, tried to, you were doing more research at the time. We had changed our diet. We even tried a vegan diet for a little bit, which worked for a little bit, but then we had to stop because that's right. what happened with vegan diets. Yeah. But had some, have some improvements. We figured, we discovered that, um, so part of the symptoms list is autoimmune stuff and like, uh, uh, joint pain, joint inflammation, you call it systemic inflammation or something. Um, <clears throat> we discovered that the cold weather was really negatively affecting both of us. So we said, okay, well, it's winter or we're going to be winter. Um, and we're in upstate New York. Why don't we do another leg? Uh, I take it a lot slower. I take it a lot slower pace while we're traveling. We'll just go to the Southern Hemisphere. So we went to New Zealand, spent the winter there, which is their summer. Um, and then 
went to Australia and in Japan where it was where it was warm and wonderful than in Japan. But yeah, so <clears throat> that was uh, that was an interesting mix of being able to do something that looked like, oh wow, look at these young go-getters out there in the world, but in reality, it was incredibly hard, especially for yeah, you. Yeah, I I um I kind of planned to blog during our trip just to kind of remember it and share with family and friends and that didn't end up happening because I was so sick and even the second leg I was very sick and it was better it was better it was less stressful because we weren't moving as much mm -hmm. um, but I was still really sick we spent a lot of that trip indoors actually um, and not exploring you know, which was really sad yeah yeah and and partly working too it was a, it was a mix of a work vacation um, but that's that's one of the other symptoms that we've been dealing with it, which is um, because of the fatigue, we will kind of st stay inside a lot. And one of the things that's happened over the years is like when we have family get togethers for a while, we had a family farm in Virginia and we'd go up there occasionally and we just sleep pretty much the whole time. And we could just couldn't help it. Our bodies, whatever, maybe being out in the countryside or something, our bodies like, this is a time to repair. So we'd have all the family together and we just, it was kind of like a running joke at the time. It was like, yeah. we'd just sleep, literally, we'd be sleeping you know, 12 hours a day and it'd be groggy the rest of it. Um, yeah. But it was also the same while we were out. Sometimes it was just, yeah, okay, you're in a new country that's exciting, but you just got to go in and, and, and There's sleep. not really another option. You can't really power through it or anything. You can't. You can't. So um, we go to Japan and we had a great, fantastic time in Japan because Japan is a paradise practically. <laughs> um, Julia goes home. I go to Thailand. I want to talk with Buddhist monks in Thailand. I got food poisoning while I was in Thailand. So, Which is exactly why I avoided Thailand. Right. So I stayed inside most of the time anyway. But while I was there, you know, going from the pot to my bed, <laughs> um, I did some thinking and I was thinking, okay, I got to be real with myself. Like right now, what do I want most in the world? And it was sleep. And it sounds, it just sounds awful. It was a, it was a sad moment where I was thinking, I've got all these problems. I've got all these ambitions. I've got all these things I want to do, but honest to goodness, all I want to do is sleep. I just want to, I just want to sleep. Yeah. So that was, that was a bad point. Um, and then it got much worse. So this is now Such a, it's ending happier. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah, yes, you're right. So we haven't even talked about the symptoms list at some point, but I don't know, maybe we'll just make an, a segment just going through as the symptoms are piling up here. So chronologically, so we come home from Thailand. Um, shortly after that, we moved to Charleston. This was last, this is just last year. So moved to Charleston in July of last year and symptoms got horrible. Um, so the fatigue was way worse. And then we had a very scary few days or, or week where um, I was invited to speak in Ohio. And so I, I flew up to Ohio to give a talk up there. And while I was up there, Julia was kind of you know, she was she was uh, sending me messages, and it was clear she was not doing well physically. That she had the time that I left, she started going downhill really quickly. So I was like, "Damn! Like I'm I'm going to be home tomorrow. Like let's let's really try to get on this. If you got to go to the hospital, go to the hospital." Uh, she was having serious, extreme chest pain. Um, down my left arm. Down down her left arm, <clears throat> very and I, and the way she was communicating, I could tell she was off. She was not quite delusional, but she was very like fuzzy. Um, so I get back and that's, I get back and it's literally the worst I had ever seen you. I have ever seen you. Um, you were just, you were on the couch the whole day. You were totally flush. You were practically del delirious. You were in tons of chest pain. We went to the ER a couple of times for the chest pain and my EKG was bad. That's when your EKG came up abnormal. Yeah, this is, this, is this is all in our head, guys, yeah. To the point where all these symptoms progress and now literally shows up on the EKG, something's affecting her heart, which was terrifying and awful. But fortunately, we actually did, that was one other doctor that was at least open-minded, was an ER, he was, the, he was the heart specialist there. 
and said, yeah, this, I, I saw this, I looked at it again, there's something wrong. We told him the story and he's like, I'm so sorry guys that you've been dealing with this. This is obviously something that's you know, between you. It's probably some kind of infection that might, might be affecting your heart. There's a, a list of things that it could be, different infectious things it could be. So I don't know why, how that uh, improved. I don't think you didn't do any antibiotics after that or anything, did you? Um, I did. Oh, you did have some? I did. Um, I had some antibiotics, which improved it slightly, um, at least as a Band-Aid. Yeah. Um, and just got me to kind of a more stable point. Yeah. And then, um, and then we discovered some more of the functional medicine, alternative medicine stuff, and yeah. that really, that turned it around immediately. Right. Well, My chest pain, like, completely went away. And about that time, I also came down with... Um, I, I, it was like it was like the flu. It wasn't near, it wasn't nearly as intense as Julia's was, but I was just, I was probably out, yeah, 16 hours. I think one of the days it was like 14 or 16 was hours. Yeah. Um, I was flush and like couldn't couldn't think clearly. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, one of the other one of the persistent symptoms. There's been two major symptoms that have followed us throughout this and progressively gotten worse to the point sometimes where they're really really bad. One is the fatigue. <clears throat> The other is, you could, it gets called brain fog. Um, and it's hard to describe, but it's, you could, I like to think of it as like brain inflammation, we call it brain smush. Um, and it is, it's kind of like being, a mixture of like being hungover and it being so tired that you're foggy and know you can't think straight and having like, it just what feels like pressure in your head yeah and i would say like your i would say your intelligence kind of goes down no you can't grab words you're more you, disconnected from you can't reality articulate you feel like you're not you feel like you're kind of in a dream yeah um i i as an extension of that you didn't suffer with this as much but i was extremely dizzy um, during this time period leading up to the heart problems mm -hmm. leading up to when we moved to charleston um I started getting very, very, very dizzy and to the point where I just stopped driving. Um, yeah. Sometimes if I um, exerted myself, I would feel like I was going to fall over. And your vision would go. Sometimes you get double vision in those moments. Yeah, double vision. Yeah, and, and that's really, that's maybe the saddest symptom of this problem is that it, it really takes your mind away. And it take and when it takes your mind away, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of your your soul away. Almost, it's like this soul crushing thing that just makes you fuzzy, which is especially hard. Maybe this is arrogant, but especially hard for us because we're such cerebral uh, people. So, like, I'm doing. I'm, and during all of this. It, and I don't want to give the impression that this is a constant thing where it's like every day you're at this level of being on the couch. Yeah, and like there was fuzzy. ups and downs. It's constantly ups and downs. It's just, it's been going, you know, it, it's been, it oscillates, but the trend for six years or five years, six years, was oscillating and going lower and lower and lower and lower. And all the, the troughs would be lower than the previous one. <clears throat> of course, to the point where we, you know, you, you had your, your heart problems. Um, but all, through this, I'm trying to put together a philosophy show, trying to have these conversations, these, what I think are pretty damn elite conversations at a very high level that demand a lot of mental performance and awareness and presence. And for the most part, perhaps to my body, I was able to muster in almost every conversation I think I've had, I was able to be with it, but it took everything that I had and I would you be would pass out. Big, exhausted afterwards. Yeah. So literally it sounds pathetic. Like I was saying before, you do kind of one thing a day. Maybe you go to the grocery store and then you're tired for the day. I'd have these conversations for an hour, maybe a couple hours, and I would be I would literally like pass out on the floor. Just completely dead tired afterwards. Which was funny because while I was having the conversations, I'd feel great. And you know, if they're intellectually stimulating, like I after the con like Literally right after the conversation, I you know I'd hang up and be like, oh that was great. I'd come talk to Julia and be like, oh all these ideas, blah blah blah. And then the adrenaline or whatever it is would kick off, and I'd be like, oh boy. And then I would just crash for hours. And, and this was, um, I'd like to add that you know, 
having this as a couple has some of heartbreak to it in a sense because I feel like we were so in love and we after we got sick we kind of became a little bit secluded in ourselves and had a hard time connecting and enjoying every you know enjoying life and enjoying life together um but at the same time I'm so grateful that we were both sick Mm. because if you were suffering with this and I had no understanding of what you're going through or the opposite way around, which I think is more likely more women go through this without their husbands realizing what's going on, um, it would have been really difficult. So I'm so grateful that we, I'm in hindsight, I'm grateful that we were sick together and have gone through this together. I agree. And a huge part of this that I want to talk a lot about not only has it been life changing to kind of have your mind taken away from you from illness, and it's just, it literally has affected our lives more than any other thing that we've dealt with. More than family death, more than losing three of our parents, two of our grandparents, is the sickness. By far, truly by far, this has affected our lives much, much greater than that. <clears throat> But the the lessons that come with it, is, but the lessons that you learn maybe as your start your health starts improving, maybe not once you're at the low, but now that I feel like once we're improving, we can reflect on it. The lessons have been invaluable, not just the lessons in philosophy, but the lessons in terms of you know, non judgment and not and and, and understanding how frail, uh, uh, terrifyingly frail our bodies are. Where you you may think that you're some hot stuff and that you've got a high processing brain, but you are, you are an inch away from losing everything. And, and we are fortunate that we have been able to slowly turn it around recently, as we'll get to. Um, but other people aren't that fortunate, and they literally can have their lives totally taken away from them. And there is not a human on this planet that can stand up to illness. There's maybe you can maybe you're good with a common cold or maybe whatever. There is some illness that would not only kill you, uh, maybe worse than kill you, is turn you into a zombie over a period of many years or a decade. Yeah. So that's just incredibly humbling. Yeah. Um, this has made me a better person. Definitely more empathetic. Um, I think a lot of people are really sick and don't necessarily want to talk about it, um, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to talk about it. We were a bit proud and um, also didn't know what was going on and didn't want it to be the subject of conversation every time we saw somebody. But I think there's a lot of people that you may think are acting strangely. um, And I would, you know, urge you just from our experiences to kind of look at those people as though you don't know the whole story. Because I think there's a lot of people out there that are struggling and you don't have the whole story. Right, yeah. And, I, and also, this has been the catalyst for a, quite a few philosophic breakthroughs and understanding the mind-body relationship and other things. But it, it literally is the case that your mind and your personality and your energy and even your values can be taken away from you without your control in an instant. And I remember thinking prior to the sickness, uh, I remember thinking, I don't know, like I feel like even if I were really sick, I would be able to like think my way through it. Like mind over matter, you can, if you have a strong enough mind, you can Like happiness is this mental state you can achieve when you think through things. Mm. (laughs) No. How dumb we were. (laughs) Incredibly naive. That is not the case. Yeah. Um, And and if you have the luxury of thinking that, that's because you've not dealt with this illness and had it taken away from you, which is a valuable lesson. So? So what I want to do is we'll just go through some symptoms that have been uh, piling up because other people may be dealing with them. And then... We'll share with you what it is because as these symptoms were piling up and as we've been recovering we've even discovered more symptoms that we thought were normal but as they disappear we go oh well gosh that we just became accustomed to that and we didn't even think it was a symptom 
there is a, an illness, a, a basket of illnesses out there, which actually um, seem to explain our circumstance. Explain all 45 of our <laughs> symptoms list, where you think it's like, okay, you have a cold or a sinus infection, so it affects your sinuses, you get a sniffly, maybe your ears ring or whatever. Oh, and you got an infection in your arm, so your arm hurts. This is like, you, literally, you were probably, maybe, you, you could probably identify... Something's 40, wrong with every body part. <laughs> yeah, like 45, and they seem so disparate. Yeah. Uh, one, for example, is like, um, pain, uh, you could say tightness on the bottom of your feet. Sounds completely arbitrary, but that tightness on the bottom of your feet. Another one, another really bad one, is inflammation at the, ba at the base of the neck, or at the base of the skull, uh, on your neck, which is a horrible one that, that we can talk about. Hair loss. Uh, hair loss is, is another one. You think, well, I didn't have to deal with that, but you had to deal with that more than I did. Um, you don't think you dealt with it. I don't think there I was a lot of hair it. on the pillow there for a while. <clears throat> but it turns out actually these aren't disparate. This isn't. Oh, you have an infection of your foot, and there's something, and there's a, a fungus on your scalp, and there's this other thing. No, it's one basket. Okay. Okay. So let's let's go through the symptoms list. We've talked about the fatigue. Um, yeah, fatigue. Yeah, and we have other oh, like, examples. Um, one thing that, um, so there was like a lot of neurological kind of stuff going on. Um, for me especially, so um, I would get numbness, tingling, stabbing sensations at the end of my fingers. On your some, face sometimes. On my face, down my face sometimes. Um, I had a leg go numb one time. Um, you know, I had this thought that like, Maybe I'll just power through it and I'll start exercising, you know, which I had tried before in the past and had really hurt me, kind of um, taking a lot of my energy. Um, but, you know, during one of my exercise routines, my whole left leg went numb. Um, and um, I've had double vision, tremors, twitches. Um, yeah, so a bunch of like neurological type mm -hmm. symptoms. Yeah, I haven't had as much of the neurological stuff. I've had a few, but you've had a bit of double vision. As I've got you, you've had it worse. Than, you've had the whole sickness worse than yeah. I have. But as I have progressed downhill, the, all of those things crop up. The, the yeah. poor vision will crop up. The 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 tingling will crop up. Um, uh, joint inflammation crops up. The thing which is really has been incredibly scary is. Um, base of the skull inflammation. I guess this is something that happens with men. It's essentially men meningitis. Um, that's when, if you have, like if you would have a really bad wave, that's when you would have horrible joint pain and then the horrible brain fog. The neck would stiffen. And the neck would stiffen and it would hurt so bad. And it was just scary in it because you could feel it right there, just swollen and inflamed, which is what happens when you have um, this problem. Um. Oh, another thing that was really scary for me, and you had this less as well, you've always had less of the severity, but for me, memory was a big issue to the point where I would take my dog for a walk and I wouldn't remember walking him, or I couldn't remember, you know, so people say, oh, what did you eat for breakfast in the morning? And maybe you'll have a hard time remembering it, but if you think, you know, throughout your day, you can say, this is what I had for breakfast. I couldn't tell you if I had eaten that day. Um, so I was having severe memory issues, couldn't remember if I had taken certain supplements, couldn't, you know, just, I would leave, I would, I was like an Alzheimer's patient in some cases, I would leave the stove on, I, I did that multiple times. Um, and I got just a taste of that a little bit. Sometimes that we would, you'd kind of pat me on the, on the, on the head when I would have a, a clear um, forgetful session where it's just, you just forget something that you know you shouldn't forget because you're in that state mm -hmm. yeah another thing we had uh, written down this is not a bad symptom but it's something that's interesting in hindsight is that you and i have both been very sensitive to alcohol where yeah. it doesn't you know she's a, a one drink drunk uh and i'm well not even you're like half a drink and i'm like one drink and i'm pretty buzzed <clears throat> and we don't drink um, regularly at all, but we've all, it's been noticeably sensitive and there's a reason for that. Um, our, our system's kind of screwed up, but it, it's also been like a perpetual dehydration that I've had. You wake up in the morning and your calves are just super tight and like I've just guzzle water um, 
constantly walking around as if you're hungover, just a state yeah. of perpetual dehydration. Perpetually hungover, and which was worse with the alcohol. Much worse with the alcohol. You know, people wouldn't, I would, I remember going to doctors and saying, I had one drink and felt like I had 10 the next day. Right. And they would go, ah. Yeah. So it's like, no, no, it. like this is a serious thing. Yeah. Just crazy, crazy sensitivity that yeah. uh, our, our systems weren't working right. Mm -hmm. And what happens with me, and I don't think it's happened with you as much, is whenever there's bad dehydration, I always get um, oh, my heart skipping. Palp yeah, we both had palpitations. Right, and I don't. And fortunately, we've discovered that, and I don't think it's dangerous when you're in that dehydrated state. But it's still scary. You're dehydrated, and then your heart's skipping, and you take a ton of water. And even when we would take a ton of water, sometimes it, it, we wouldn't feel hydrated. Again, there's a reason for that. Yeah, so then um, the last thing that's a big category is depression and anxiety. So this is a, a frustrating one because throughout all of this, there's been many doctors who have tried to lump all of this in, in the category of depression, that it's sudden onset depression at the same time, or if we don't understand what it is, then it's something that's in your head. And it's frustrating because the, definitely part of this has been depression, worse for you than for me, but we both had it. And it's partly, or largely, in fact, because of the damn illness. It's not we're depressed, which is making our symptoms all these things. It's that we're in our early and mid-20s, got this damn infection that can't go away, has spiraled into this list of 40 freaking symptoms. Everybody's dismissing us. We can't figure out what the hell's going on. It's massively affecting our lives, and we can't do anything about it. That's depressing. Yeah, and, and the more research I've done about mental illness is, is that there are a lot of physical causes for it. And it seems like outside of the normal medical establishment that these physical causes of depression are quite widely accepted and studied and in practice, um, you know, diets and supplementation are used to correct a lot of these disorders. Um, for just to give one example, um, there's something called pyrrol depression, um, where some people are more disposed to leak a lot of zinc into their urine um, and vitamin B6. And this can cause depression, anxiety, rage. And this is not something that your normal medical doctor would test you for or, you know, look at your fingernails to see how healthy they're looking or to ask you, you know, can you recall your dreams? This is not a common practice. However, this is something that a portion of the population struggles with and they have a depression that's fully treatable with really benign supplements. And it's really unfortunate to me that a lot of mental illness is now seen as just something that's unavoidable, that is all situation oriented or a serotonin imbalance or something of that nature. Yeah, psychological. And I think definitely, obviously some people go through really stressful times and it's very, um, it's very clear that their life circumstances can be really depressing, but there's a huge subset of the population where their lives seemingly would result in a happy, productive person, and they are still struggling. And I don't feel like the medical establishment is looking at these people correctly in, an, in a holistic sense where let's look at your body and right. let's see how things are going. Right. There's no, there's no systems level analysis in, it seems like, in the mainstream medical establishment. There's specialization. There's people who know how to cut out little nodules from your liver, but there's not people that synthesize their knowledge across and see the big picture of what the body is, which is this massively complex system where if you change one variable, it's going to change a lot of other variables. I know there's a lot of research coming out now about the gut brain connection. People are saying, well, maybe depression is caused by some gut imbalances. Yeah, that's totally possible. If you were to say that prior to the, the fancy, the, the experts uh, putting it in the official journals, you'd be labeled as a crank. What do you mean? There's a connection between your gut and your brain. They're so far apart. There's no way. Well, actually, it turns out there is probably a very strong connection between the gut and the brain. Um, <clears throat> it might be that taking probiotics and trying to fix the 
the tight junctures in your intestine can help people with depression, mm. you know, which that's totally possible when you see the whole thing as, as one functioning system rather than these isolated things that don't communicate with one another. Yeah, and even, you know, even like severe disorders like schizophrenia, you know, schizophrenia has been linked to that pyrol um, problem where you're leaking zinc and B6 and, and things of that nature. And, you know, people who commit crime have, you know, been shown to have higher copper levels and in their brains and, and different different things like this where maybe, maybe we can't just label somebody as a bad person or your brain is messed up and this is just the dice that you were that you rolled and everyone has their crap and you know this is yours i just feel like that's so unempowering and um really unfortunate for anybody who's struggling with mental illness out there i would really urge you to look into some um i think there's a youtube video called the molecular basis of depression on YouTube, it's um, by the Reordan Clinic in Wichita, Kansas. Um, it's extremely interesting and um, probably helpful for a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's reasonable to suspect that biology may underpin a huge amount of human behavior. Maybe all of it, I'm not sure. And questions of free will here and what exactly is the mind and how much can you control. but going down this route and looking at some of the stuff you've been researching and we've been talking about, I really think that if you could fix people's bodies, you may very well fix their minds and their disposition. They may be better people. They may be happier. They may be more fulfilled. They may be more spiritual. Yeah. I mean, the rabbit holes goes very deep when you discover just how intimately connected your mind is with your biology. Yeah. So, yes, um, and, and I don't want to imply that there's no, in no circumstances, there's no causal connection between a psychological depression or like a belief system or a network of beliefs that are very negative and it manifesting in uh, physiological problems. I know that happens. That's definitely the case. But yeah, I think sure. very often it's a bludgeon that people use where if you don't, if they don't understand what's going on, they hit you. They, they they hit you over the head with it and say, "Well, it must be psychological." In our case, we had pretty dang healthy functioning minds, pretty dang healthy functioning psychological systems. Yeah, we had some bad experiences, but they were prefaced by getting this this um, mutual infection that just hasn't gone away. Okay. Any other symptoms you wanna you wanna talk about? We... Those are the main ones. Okay, those are the main... uh, let's not bore them with uh, the laundry list. <laughs> Literally, the f more than forty other ones that we can yeah. talk about. Okay, so now we get to the near the end of the story. <clears throat> so Julia has this horrible reaction in July of last year. Somehow we stumbled on. I think what it was is she she came across a. Oh, I know um, what it was. An infection. It was imaging Italian, wasn't it? Yeah, um, it was. But just to preface what you're yeah, saying, okay. um, I had um, seen a doctor in Charleston, and the doctor um, had said something like, it sounds like you have chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh, yeah, right. And um, I arrogantly, for many years, had not looked into chronic fatigue syndrome because I had thought that that disease was um, psychological. And I blame myself a little bit for that, but I also blame the kind of messaging in the mainstream media and the mainstream medical system that this disease doesn't really exist um, and that it shouldn't be really taken seriously and only like rich housewives get this disease or something like that. Um, so she said, you know, it sounds, and she printed me off a thing from uptodate.com, which I have my own problems with. Um, but from uptodate.com, she printed me off this little pamphlet. And sure enough, I read it because somebody had handed it to me. And it really did sound like partially what I was going through. And so I humbled myself and went onto the internet and discovered a huge group of people suffering from a very 
uh, uh, the same condition as right. what we had is what I would say. And and putting together all these disparate symptoms where it's like, oh, people have this and that together. Right. Really? In my mind, chronic fatigue syndrome was just being very tired. Mm -hmm. And in it's such a bad name, unfortunately, for the disease. And I think it's the main symptom of the disease, which is why it's called chronic fatigue. It was called chronic fatigue syndrome. Now it's called myalgic encephalitis, I think. Um, and there's a lot of clinical um, things that they can get into now that people with chronic fatigue syndrome show and have in common, um, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, gut problems, um, swelling of the meninges, I suppose, um, in the brain. So um, I really had a wake-up call and... In that search, there was a few interesting things that came up, one of them being um, genitalium. Right. So there was this um, bacteria, it's either a bacteria or a tiny parasite, something like that, called um, M. genitalium. And apparently, it's not very well understood, it's, not, it's very hard to diagnose, kind of goes under the radar, it can cause reproductive problems that we had been having. We'd never been tested for it. We had never had, I don't think we had the drugs um, that they prescribed no. for it. Mm -mm. So it was like, oh my gosh, I bet this is it. It's obviously infectious. Well, and it caused um, different, if left to go on long enough, it caused different body issues as well. Yes. So we were thinking, oh, maybe this is the, the thing. We were thinking this, it was, at, up to that point, it was the most confident by far I'd been in any um, positive diagnosis saying this has got to be what it is. This just fits so well. Well, it wasn't that. Um, we got tests for that. It wasn't that. But getting that breakthrough led to discovering some other tests that were also not really done properly that we did figure out what was going on. Shall I continue or would you like to? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, go ahead. So... After all of this, after all of these tests and all of these freaking years and all of these doctors, Julia insisted on getting a Lyme disease test. And I think we had one crummy Lyme disease test a long time ago, but it turns out that that test that we had is poorly made. Um, <clears throat> I guess all, pretty much all Lyme, Lyme disease tests are poorly made, um, or most of them at least. Yeah. So we just dismissed it. I, I remember doing research and thinking, yeah, it sounds like some of our symptoms, but we got tested and that's not us. I'm never moving on. Julia insisted, even, even the doctor, we, we went to our first alternative health doctor person down in Charleston and he was like, well, yeah, probably not. But if you want it, we'll order it anyway. Bing, bing, bing. It came back positive that it is Lyme disease. Yeah, and or, or, or was it Bartonella first, or was it Lyme disease first? Um, it was Bar Bartonella first. Bartonella, I have a positive serological test, so there's. Um, well, hang on. So, so okay. I'm gonna say Bartonella. So okay. There, Lyme disease comes with co-infections, other little bugs. Um, one of them is Bartonella, and one of them is Babesia, um, and then there's the the Lyme um, uh, bacteria. Borrelia. Borrelia, yeah. And to, it might be the case that the actually the, the things that causes the symptoms are the co-infections, Bartonella in particular for our symptoms, yeah. um, but Babesia and it, it, Lyme disease is this really mushy area where there's a lot of confusion about it, partly because the diagnostic criteria is poor and other things, but also it's got a nickname as the great imitator. It is the known as the disease that gets misdiagnosed for years at a time and gets called, maybe it's RA, maybe it's lupus, maybe yeah. it's this, maybe it's that, maybe it's in your head, that this is what happens with Lyme disease. Um, and finally, yeah, we're both from upstate New York. We came from places where I, I know I've been bitten by plenty of ticks. Yeah, so we got the positive I have not bag. been bitten by ticks, but right. we'll get into that later. But right. um, also just wanted to add there um, that out of all the 50 doctors we saw, nobody recommended this. So our kind of conclusion with the mainstream medical establishment is that um, most doctors, I think we have a good sample size at this point, um, most doctors um, 
will not be able to figure out anything that's slightly complex. Um, yeah, pretty much. However, we have a um, Steve has a viewer and a patron um, that we both know, and I remember after we had figured out, or not actually before we had figured out what was going on, but we were getting testing for Lyme disease. Um, you were talking to him on the phone, and you were kind of telling him what was going on. And he said, oh, it sounds like Lyme disease. <laughs> right. The guy, right. Exactly. So You know who you are. You know who you are. <laughs> um, but he was right. And um, he is not a doctor, but right. he's smarter than any doctor we saw. And he's a medical professional. So shout out to you. Yeah. Interested in philosophy and critical thinking, too, not coincidentally. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, what had... You know, we got some testing for Lyme disease, and um, this testing, um, the testing that is standardly used is serological testing, which is uh, testing your blood um, um, and a, an immuno test. So um, if your immune system is reacting in a certain way to an infection, it will show up on the test through your antibody levels, and they can, the, theoretically, they can say whether or not you have an infection. Um, turns out with Lyme disease um, that, you know, if you've had it long enough, um, your immune markers for this disease are not as straightforward. Um, they can come up, um, in Steve's case, his immune test shows false positive. Um, yeah, for, for, the, for the reason, which is this is laughable. So, well, for you, well, let's just say um, okay. you got a PCR test. Yeah, so PCR is a test where they take a little probe of DNA and um, kind of go through cycling, heating up a mixture of your blood and seeing if that probe of DNA picks up its mate and um, replicates that over and over and over again with an enzyme. And um, it's very accurate in terms of um, not giving false positives. Um, and this is common knowledge among um, biologists and medical professionals alike. And um, I had a positive PCR test, um, which from, means- From a blood. From blood, which yeah. means I had Lyme DNA in my blood. Right. Um, there's also another test that can be done called a live culture, I think, I believe it's called, and many people have seen the Lyme bacteria in their blood. But Steve, yeah. um, Steve had an interesting result where he, his, um, I had no immune markers for Lyme, like essentially none, um, but this apparently has been shown, Lyme has been shown to kind of um, mess your immune system up, so your immune system can't respond to it appropriately. Steve, um, interestingly, had immune markers for the acute infection of Lyme disease, which mm -hmm. they um, call a false positive. Okay, so this you can't even make up. Yeah. Okay, so the first part, what you said, I do want to give a little more, more meat to the bones here. So Lyme, one of the Lyme tests is this immunomarker. But the trouble is with Lyme disease, it's such a bitch that if you've got it for long enough and your body can't get rid of it, it starts killing your, it essentially starts killing your immune system so you don't get the, yeah. the markers anymore. It's been shown to dysregulate, yeah. Right, so, so yeah. they're trying to d diagnose people with Lyme disease with this one test by seeing whether or not you have the immune markers, but even if you had it for long enough and severe enough, you're not gonna have the immune markers, which is why there's, it's misdiagnosed all the time, one of the reasons. Fortunately, Julia got the PCR thing. She's got Lyme in her bloodstream, no questions asked. Well, well, I don't think... <laughs> it's funny because that would be no questions asked for any other infection, but because Lyme disease... Because there's a taboo around There's a taboo around Lyme right. disease. Uh, PCR is suddenly not not acceptable for uh, for Lyme disease. So, so that's something we also have to talk about because probably people won't realize how controversial Lyme is for lots of reasons that we yeah. can go into. But for me, this is so absurd. So I have the acute inflammation markers. What that means is, according to their diagnostic criteria, if I had the symptoms of Lyme disease for less than six months, I would have a positive diagnosis of Lyme disease because of that test. Because I have had the symptoms of Lyme disease for more than six months, they now call it a false positive. <laughs> because you can't they, they go oh, you can't have this marker after six months or whatever it is. yeah crazy absolutely bananas that we ha you've got in your blood uh, stream 
I've got the markers for it because I've had it so long. Even though Lyme disease can last for a long, 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 long period of time, they're going to say, no, it's a false positive. Yeah, and, and what's really interesting, too, is that people who have access to microscopes in like a university setting or who are biologists themselves come down with the sickness, um, you know, chronic get diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome or some autoimmune condition or, um, you know, and then somebody says to them, it might be Lyme. And they'll take their blood, they'll look at it under a microscope, see the Lyme disease, and tell their doctor, hey, I looked at my blood under a microscope and I saw Lyme disease. Um, the doctor will be like, you don't have Lyme disease. So right. um, it's really interesting that I don't know, I don't know why the confidence, I, I, don't, I don't get it, but... It, Anyway, yeah. So it's a methodological error. It's just pure philosophy that these people have been taught and trained that the diagnosis procedure that you use is what comes out of the CDC. That's what they all refer to. Unfortunately, it's just an appeal to authority. They have trust in the accuracy of that diagnostic criteria. If it's the case that the diagnostic criteria is wrong, then these people will dismiss you. They will, they will be wrong. They will misdiagnose you because they have no other method of knowing whether or not you have Lyme disease if it is not in accordance with the CDC diagnostic um, criteria. Now, this is now, this is a super controversial issue now. Uh, Lyme is a super controversial issue. Controversial issue. I think because there's quite a lot of egos uh, involved at this point. Didn't know this prior to the fact, but when you start investigating, suddenly you discover, well, actually, there's quite a lot of MDs, professional MDs out there, who are who are saying, screaming, the diagnostic criteria is wrong. These tests are wrong. Uh, we've got a really bad problem here. And now you get into like medical politics yeah, with the CDC, a, also to, connected to government. Yeah, of there's a small minority, loud minority of people who are dealing with these patients and um, see firsthand what they're dealing with and run run more in depth testing and run a, like immune tests and inflammation markers that aren't typically run. And you know they're finding these really um, big significant markers in people and um i don't know it's just it's just really interesting um and and recently they just revised the cc revised their estimate for the the frequency of lyme disease up by a factor of 10. Yeah. Their, by their own metrics they were off by an order of magnitude yeah so what's to say they're not off by another order of magnitude um but when you dive into it when you see the politics of what's uh, and the egos and the arrogance of the parties involved with the uh, Lyme uh, disease testing, diagnostics, um, uh, treatment, it is just totally depressing. It's a, it's a damnation of the human condition, in my opinion. So um, just to kind of address the, some skepticism that, um, you know, we both have as well um, going into this. Um, we had read a bunch of stuff online saying, oh, you know, there's a bunch of quacky doctors and quacky people out Which there. there are. Yeah, there are. There are a bunch of quack doctors and quacky people out there, I'm sure. Well, actually, I'm actually not so sure anymore, but um, that's another story. But um, there's a, there's, I read online that there was a bunch of people out there who think they have Lyme disease and they don't have Lyme disease. Um, and we went into this very cautiously and, and, um, skeptically and go, okay, well, we have this test, but who knows if it's actually Lyme disease. Although mine was kind of pretty um, definitive, but you know, your test was a little right. less definitive. But um, so we started working with a functional medicine doctor who is an MD um, and started treating our Lyme disease with a laundry list of supplements and herbs mm -hmm. and we have seen gigantic improvement over a period of six months now yes which has never ever ever been the case before so at this point my um kind of conclusion is i don't care uh you know if this disease is kind of accepted by the mainstream or even if this is really the right diagnosis all i know is that there is an alternative health community out there that has figured out a way of treating people with symptoms like us 
that is helping us. And I'm, you know, I don't care what they call it. I don't really, you know, it's really interesting as you start looking into these diseases, um, our doctor, as soon as you start talking to a doctor who deals with people like us, he would be able to tell us our symptoms and, you know, exactly what was causing them and would say, this supplement here is going to make you feel like this and predict to the T what was going to happen. So, um, and explain to us what was happening in our bodies. And, you know, that was just amazing to me. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was mind blowing, this has resulted really in a worldview shift in terms of um, like, I, I pride myself in being open-minded, but I'm discovering I was very, 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 very dogmatic about alternative health stuff. I just had a, opinions about things I truly did not understand. Um, yeah, no, nothing, both of us did, both of us did. Yeah, nothing will shake you out of that than um, having a sickness like this that is improved in one of the following ways, which prior to investigation, I would have laughed, literally would have laughed at. Um, part of our uh, treatment is these tinctures. They're these little tiny little vials um, and they've got a bajillion different herbs in them. And my, my skepticism about this whole, going down this whole process has been- Smacked out of you. <laughs> it's been smacked out of me, but at yeah. the beginning especially was through the roof. It was to the point where I was like, look, We'll we'll try this because we've tried everything else for years and it's failed, but it's not going to work. This is superstitious nonsense. Which, it's yeah. just that there's not a chance that it's going to work. So one of the reasons is because so there's these little tinctures, and sometimes you mix them with water, just a few, literally a few drops of these tinctures. And uh, when we started, we got huge side effects from it, like positive. Uh, negative, our body was reacting greatly to um, the, just a few drops of liquid. And then it got even crazier, which is if you need a smaller dose, you don't even sw sw take it in liquid, you rub it in your hands. You have these little, you literally like in the evening, you know, we've got our stuff, we do four drops of this herbal mixture on our hands, we rub it in, and it definitely results in significant um, uh, t changes. But I would have laughed at the idea that you could absorb an herbal tincture through your skin, but actually... And significantly and affect your condition. Significantly. Hmm. Turns out, when you look into it, yes, actually, there you can have topical absorption of antibiotics. I don't know about antibiotics. Birth but, control. Um, yeah, there's all kinds yeah, of things you can do topically. I just had no idea that that was yeah. the case, and I thought it was silly. But these, these herbs are super mega potent. Nicotine. And you get, yeah, nicotine. Yeah. You get, uh, we've had huge, huge symptom improvement as a result of, among other things, these little tinctures. And I, and I was just floored by this. I thought there was no way that was possible, but it happened. Mm -hmm. I do want to comment on what you said about, you know, maybe this isn't the right diagnosis because from my perspective, it's really hard to shake the skepticism that I have. Like if you guys have been following my show, I'm skeptic, massively skeptical of everything. I have, my life motto is that everybody is wrong about everything all the time. And that's only a slight exaggeration. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very possible that actually the, the skeptical camp is correct and incorrect. And the Lyme camp and alternative medicine camp is correct and incorrect at the same time in different ways. And he, so it might, that might very well be the case that actually this uh, Lyme Borrelia is not the cause of these symptoms, this basket of symptoms that is shared by a million people out there, just a, a huge amount of people that are dealing with this. It might be that this is like a corollary, that the alternative health practitioners who are trying to deal with Lyme, Bartonella, and, Borel and uh, Babesia, in their process of trying to deal with this like side problem that is correlated but not causative, they actually are fixing some of the more systemic problems that might screw up your, uh, your excretory system, for example. You can't get out um, negative byproducts of, of metabolism. Like it might be that you're not digesting things properly. There might be a whole laundry list of actual causes that in effect get treated by the alternative uh, uh, medicine crowd, even though they kind of have the theory wrong. They get the cause and effect relationships wrong, but in practice they can actually fix the problem. Totally open to that being the case. Yeah, and, and actually the more I look into kind of Lyme, this Lyme 
community and the offshoots of the Latin community, um, I'm kind of coming to more of the conclusion that our problem isn't kind of um, reduced to Lyme disease. Yeah. That Lyme disease or an overgrowth of the Lyme bacteria, I would like to say. I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit unconvinced that... Um, just its presence is a problem. That, yeah, that, that, right, that maybe you can carry Lyme without it being an issue. And I think probably a lot of people do carry Lyme without it being an issue. But for us, I think it's definitely out of balance. You shouldn't be able to detect the DNA in my bloodstream. And um, it's causing us some issues. But I think there, the more research I do, I think there is a broader picture of things that are kind of like a pillar effect of health. And um, I think our you know modern lifestyles and a lot of things that we think are innocuous are probably not innocuous. Diet's a big one. Um, diet and um, a bunch of different things that are happening um, that we, we've struggled with, you know, we had bad diets as um, kids and um, right before we got sick, we both had rounds of antibiotics, which I think is really interesting. That may have made us more susceptible to this type of overgrowth. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a really big picture and I don't think there's a very easy kind of pretty box to fit it in. Right. Um, so I almost don't even like saying that we have Lyme disease. I don't think we have Lyme disease in a normal kind of way that people would think of an infection or a disease. Right. It's, it's like we have the thing called Lyme disease, which is correlated with Borrelia. Yeah. I would say that our bodies are extremely dysfunctional. Yeah. And part of that reason is um, overgrowth of certain microbes that are um pathogenic past a certain point and we are past that point and i would also say that um our immune system isn't doing well our internal organs aren't doing that great um, we've, um our nutrient levels aren't doing that great our mitochondria is not doing that great a bunch of things that i'm you know is really depressing when you kind of look at your health and and look at the state of your health and um but I would also say that it's really encouraging because the alternative health community, as much as we um, were skeptical of them before, has helped a lot of people. And um, a lot of people I've talked to personally who, you know, have no incentive to like bullshit me or anything. They're yeah. just people that have lived their lives and have told us what's been going on with them. And the alternative health community has really helped these people and figured out, even if they don't have a clear understanding of why, what they're, what the interventions they're doing are yeah, helping right. people, they are helping people. And I would also like to say that a lot of this herbal treatment is based off of thousands of years of herbal study from Chinese medicine or other um, Eastern um, medicine practices that... Um, I think is really arrogant to discount. Um, and I, I've been coming to this kind of conclusion more and more as I get older that, oh, people who have come before us were not idiots. They were making causal connections just like us without the internet, without peer reviewed studies. And to say, to discount them would be stupid. And um, I really don't like the idea that I feel like is um, really common that, you know, oh, people were like apes before our generation came along or our technology, that they didn't, you know, they were so stupid they didn't know what they were talking about. I don't think that's true at all. I think, I think there was a lot of wisdom throughout the years that has been lost, and which is really unfortunate. Um, and I think there's some really amazing scientists and thinkers that have come before us that their information has been lost or or it's, or you know used so minimally at this point that it's it's unfortunate yeah and I, i'd come at it from a, from kind of the opposite angle where i'd say uh people at present are fantastically stupid but equally fantastically stupid as people in the past it's not that they were so smart 
before is that nobody was smart in my in my perspective everybody was everybody's always been wrong about everything but what the previous generations have had is the benefit of not having a screwed up incentive structure in the medical establishment they've had the the benefit of, of having kind of a, a more empirical practice what works what doesn't work now their theories might be wrong a great example of this is um chi like energy flow so I am guilty of dismissing the, the theory of energy flow uh, for years. <laughs> uh, and I didn't understand it. I took it very literally. Well, there is no such thing and it can't be measured. That's silly. That's a very myopic way of understanding what these people are talking about. It, it may very well be that their theoretical explanation for the metaphysical existence of chi is incorrect, but they might not even be claiming that such a thing exists in the first place. It might very well be that it's metaphorical, or that it has something to do with pathways of uh, um, the transmission of waste through your body, or the transmission of blood or oxygen through your body, that they're speaking metaphorically, that through a period of tr uh, trial and error over thousands of years, they said, okay, well, when we press over here and we poke over here, we have a, we have a result over there. So we're going to draw a little line and say there's a connection between this pressure point in your arm and this pressure point in your foot and in your neck or whatever. They've got all those lines. Maybe those things don't literally exist. Maybe there's no metaphysical essence. But in practice, acting as if is the, that is the case res can result in the improvement of symptoms. That type of thing I would have totally thought was um, impossible. Yeah, well, like other examples of this, um, you know, modern people look back at some of these practices and say, oh, they're, they're so crude. How could they ever think this would work? You know, they were so stupid or, you know, they were so heartless or something like that. And one of these examples is um, they used to put psychiatric patients in ice cold baths. Yeah. And, um, you know, people look back at that and say, oh, that's so inhumane. But it turns out that, you know, ice cold baths create these, um, you know, this reaction in your body that can be calming to your nervous system and regulate your nervous system better and um, help with some psychiatric problems. So it wasn't like these people were, were just kind of shooting darts right. at, you know, in the dark. It, it, I mean, they were making observations and just yeah. because we, you know, wouldn't think of doing that now doesn't mean that there wasn't some benefit. It's not like they, you know, I mean, I'm sure there was, a, I mean, I know there was a lot of mistreatment of psychiatric <laughs> patients. I think there still is a lot of um, mistreatment of psychiatric patients. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it's, n it's probably not good to discount all of these old techniques and just discount them as stupid or immoral. Yeah, and how many examples do you need of that phenomenon taking place? You had an old procedure that was working that people used. Then we had the enlightened uh, researchers say, well, there's no peer-reviewed, double-blind, randomized, controlled st study which say that putting people in a cold bath will improve their mental state. So therefore, it's superstition and mysticism. And then a few decades later, oh, actually now the researchers are coming around and saying, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe there are these cold shock proteins that have this systemic reaction and whatever calms your immune system. It's like, well, hang on. So we, we have established the principle that maybe that procedure was resulting in a, a positive benefit and the experts that thought it was mysticism were wrong and actually it's probably a good treatment. Maybe it's better than putting, you know, sticking lithium in a, in a pill we, to try to tweak your mind. Should we tell them about the um, broccoli sprout detox? Yes, please do. Oh, oh, yes, this is a thing, a topic I want, I want to preface and you got to give, okay. give the example. Okay. Right. So the rabbit hole runs very deep and it's weird for somebody that is, uh, that disagrees with the metaphysical presuppositions of the Pythagorean theorem and does have a, by the way, does have a finitist corollary of the Pythagorean theorem. But anyway, I have skepticism <laughs> of anyway. fundamental ideas that everybody thinks are true. And yet, for some reason, when, when applied to the medical practice, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised at how weird my belief system is. Like, oh, wow, I'm believing those, those weird things. Here's a great example from the skeptics community. It's the term detoxing. There's this whole community of people, the skeptics, who think detoxing is such a joke. There's no such thing. Oh, no, no, that's just woo-woo mysticism. 
These people speak without an ounce of understanding, without an ounce of research, because if you actually research, yes, detoxing is actually a thing. Like your body does produce toxins, metabolic waste. Just by living, your body is producing waste. That waste can build up if your systems aren't functioning properly. So do you want to, so, um, yeah, why don't you tell them that? that okay. Story? Well, um, I think the concept, um, I think at least from my understanding of the skeptic viewpoint is that, um, you have a liver and the liver does its job and that, that does detox your body. And therefore <laughs> there is nothing that can improve that function. I suppose, I, right. I think that's, that, that's the argument. You, I think you that's have the kidneys skeptic and argument. liver and they're universally always functioning at a high level and you can never have liver or kidney trouble right. that result in, in detoxing yeah. not working properly. So anyway, yeah. um, so a few years ago, there was a study on um, broccoli sprout juice. So they juiced broccoli sprouts. Which is the crunchiest thing. Yeah. Most like hippy dippy yeah. juicing your broccoli sprouts Rhonda for Patrick, detoxing. Yeah, man. Rhonda Patrick would be proud. Um, but anyway, um, they juice these broccoli sprouts and a big, a big part of this like detoxing industry is juices. And I can understand where the skeptics come from, where it's like, there's no proven double blind study about these juices. Um, so I understand that I get where they're coming from, but at the same time, no proof and false are two different things. So this and is no proof according to one particular methodological of, criteria, which right. is dubious. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Well, continue. anyway, so anyway, so I think that's really interesting, but anyway, so this is a juice and they gave it to, um, I think Chinese participants, um, who had, um, been exposed to airborne toxins from, um, like smog and just air pollution in general. And um, some of them received a placebo and some of them received the broccoli sprout juice. And they measured the amount of the pollutants coming out in their urine. And they measured them before and after giving this juice. What they discovered is that more of these um, pollutants were coming out in the urine of people who were taking the juice. So, so you could call that detoxing. You could say that they were able to process and excrete those toxins quicker than the other group of people that were receiving the placebo. Could call it that. You could call it that. However, uh, if you look the study up, there is an article and a quote from some I'm sure expert with a bunch of letters after his name and like some sort of job that's very prestigious. Mm -hmm. And I think what he said was something along the lines of detoxing is a scam. You have a liver. That's what it's used for. And this is all like, this is all bunk. Don't call this detoxing, blah, blah, blah. So, but you have to think to yourself, okay, well, okay, if he's an expert, let's think about that. But then you think to yourself, well, I'm pretty sure both of the groups, the placebo and the broccoli sprout juice group, both had livers. So it's <laughs> right. like they both had livers, yet the juice made one of them excrete more of the bad stuff out of their body. So it's like, I uh, I don't know what to say there. In it's the like, article you're talking about, this guy said, well, okay, yeah, they were excreting the, the toxins uh, at a higher rate, but we can't, at, we can't recommend it, right? And uh, yeah. like, we're, it's unclear whether or not this is something that is like beneficial. So it's crazy to recommend that right, this could be yeah. part of the detox process, like in, improving your, your detox, detoxification pathways. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that to me is very strange. So there's a million examples of that. And what's, there's a, a, important points here. One is somehow people discovered that juiced broccoli sprouts can detox or help your body process toxins more efficiently or more effectively. Somehow people discovered that knowledge prior to the randomized controlled double-blind peer review study by the experts. Oh, and sometime, yeah. somehow, 
they were right. There's some working theory where they actually correctly identified these two radically disparate things like juiced broccoli sprouts and toxin processing, and they were correct about it, mm. despite the evidence. I also wanted to add that um, it's these toxins that we're talking about, like we're using the word toxins, these are widely accepted as carcinogenic um, and pollutants and things that you should not ingest and that like people in the mainstream medical community accept as like really bad shit that you don't want in your body. So right. uh, I'm not saying toxins as this woo-woo thing that like, you know, this innocuous substance that right. the alternative health community calls a toxin that the ma mainstream medical establishment doesn't. These were toxins. Right. Um, so that was interesting. Oh yeah, it was to it was cancer causing stuff, wasn't it? Yeah, carcinogenics, it? Yeah, yeah. I forget, I forget exactly yeah. which one it was, but yeah. Yeah, um, but anyway, and, and also I wanna add that can you imagine all of the products that actually help with that? That, um, you know, this is one natural sprout juice substance. Um, but think of all of the other things that are actually helping with these things. And it's funny to me because a lot of mainstream, I actually looked up some of these chemicals that they were talking about, the pollutants they were talking about, and the pollutants were actually part of, of, drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, um, which I thought was really funny because it was like, okay, here's, you know, supposedly this quack alternative health mm. community that's recommending, you know, juices and, and herbs and different natural substances. And the mainstream medical community is telling them they're quacks, telling them that detoxing doesn't exist even with this kind of very clear, what I would call a clear study. And then the toxins that people are excreting are from pharmaceutical drugs. Well, I, I'm, so it, it may very well be the case that in many circumstances, the medical establishment causes more bodily harm. Western medical establishment causes more medical harm than good. Now, that's, I'm saying that's all the time. I know they've saved lots of people's lives. I've been saved by antibiotics, I'm sure, many times when those acute infections that I had, I probably would have died. Well, uh, if I couldn't have had antibiotics, but who knows? Because we don't, we didn't have any access to anybody who had any alternative well, other true. than antibiotics. So who knows? That's true. But it might be that this is like an economic principle. There are unintended consequences. Yeah. Okay. You took the antibiotics and maybe it saved you from a few extra days of the sinus infection, but now you've screwed up your gut bacteria and you may be more likely to get depression. Oh yeah. Or, or there, a million yeah. other side effects that are there that just aren't easily measured. Yeah, there's another thing that I just want to talk about briefly is that there um, is some new evidence to suggest that taking antibiotics, um, you know, obviously affects your gut flora, which is now being connected to um, mental health. But there was a study recently um, talking about the connection between taking antibiotics and an increased risk of anxiety or depression. Um, so... To me, that's really significant. And I don't think a doctor, when they're prescribing you an antibiotic for a sinus infection or a UTI or anything like that, they're saying, hey, you can take this antibiotic, but in fine print, let's just make sure we tell you, you might have an increased risk of mental right. illness in the future. Right. And who knows what other things there it, it's affecting. Um, the more I learn about the gut and the immune system and the whole body, the more I think that um, the antibiotics that we took before getting sick may have set the stage for us right. getting an overgrowth of these certain microbes and our body kind of going on this dysfunction, right. um, dysfunctional path. So there are a couple more, two more things I want to talk about. Um, one is a, an example. Uh, well, uh, actually, okay, three more things. <clears throat> one is uh, I, we could do a whole long series on, which is the epistemology of medical knowledge. So epistemology is the study of knowledge in the abstract, but this would be about how knowledge flows in the medical community because our experiences and the people that we've talked with and the people and the researchers and the community we're involved with now, it's very clear that the information channels between researchers, practitioners, and patients is completely broken completely broken, where the actual effects 
uh, of drugs, let's say, are not adequately reported back to practitioners, adequately reported back to researchers. I did an a episode a while ago um, on Levaquin, which is this thing which supposedly only a tiny fraction of people have joint pain as a side effect. But actually, I know four people in my life who've taken Levaquin, all of different bloodlines, all of whom had very severe joint pain. Julia was one, my dad was one, um, almost completely crippled him. Uh, my, my prostate doctor, um, the guy that I have a lot of respect for, had to get foot surgery because his foot tendon snapped after taking Levaquin. So maybe it's the case that the four people that I've talked to who have taken Levaquin and had uh, significant side effects uh, just coincidentally we're part of the 0.05% or something. Exactly. Or, or it's the case that actually the, the data is not being reported back to the researchers. Your data was not entered into any books anywhere. Neither was my dad's. Neither was um, the doctor's. Neither was my sister-in-law. So that's a problem. That's a huge methodological problem. It's the same thing with, I think, all, uh, adverse reactions to all kinds of medical procedures are not entered back into the system. You don't find them in the study. So it's, so anyway, that's a whole nother thing. It's, it's, uh, there are so many methodological problems and um, errors in the flowing of information that it, it causes me such significant doubt in the efficacy of the Western medical establishment that I actually am very skeptical of the reliability of um, the procedures and the diagnosis um, of um, maybe the majority of um, medical practice uh, in the West. I know like what this, this uh, listener um, who I'm talking about is a practitioner and he, he's told me the, just the horror stories of people over prescribing antibiotics, prescribing the wrong antibiotics all the time. They don't even, so the studies are probably bad studies. The practitioners are prescribing the wrong antibiotics. They don't read the studies. And then the, the reactions that the, the people are getting aren't even entered back into the books it's like this whole system is just error upon error upon error. That yeah. when you get outside of it, it's like, oh, that's not a system I want to be a part of. Okay. Then now there's two more things. We've narrowed it down to one more thing. So as we are researching, as Julia is doing most of the research, not only are we finding s uh, sensible theories coming from many alternative medical people, not all of them. I think there's plenty of quacks out there who have completely wrong theories about how the world works. Um, I don't think they know. I, I mean, we've had the first alternative doctor that we went to, Yeah. I, I don't think he knew it. Well, I think he was pretty good by normal standards. I don't think he knew it was what I he I don't think doing. he could have fixed us, no. um, but he's well-intentioned. And um, it's interesting that we've tried two alternative medical doctors and one of them is really helping us. So that's 50% reliability versus, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, what's one in 50? Yeah. 2%? Yeah. So there's actually people out there. Susan Humphreys is one of them doing interesting research. Uh, Chris Shades doing one of them. Uh, there's a few like people who are doing real high quality research that are in the alternative health world that, are, that actually know what they're talking about. Zach Bush. Yeah, I think that I think that's the minority, but the ones that are out there are actually re doing really important work that's high quality. Okay, um, so anyway, we're discovering this that there's alternative theories out there, just like there are alternative theories at the foundations of mathematics, which when you dive into are perfectly reasonable and explain the phenomena we experience. We're also discovering just how crazy and myopic and frankly unforgivably stupid some standard medical practices are in the West. Unforgivably stupid. Before we give the best example that I've heard recently, let me give you another story that my brother told me in religion. This is a, this is a great example and it's a, like a corollary of, what's, of what the medical establishment is, has done. So my brother has told me this funny story that I get a kick out of and I use as a kind of an example of poor thinking and how silly people are. And it's a, a, a statue of Moses, or multiple statues, I guess, of oh, Moses. Yeah, okay. Moses, the biblical figure. And apparently, in a lot of these statues, he's got horns. Moses has horns. Because the sculptors thought, well, that's in the, that's in the holy book, that Moses has horns, so they sculpted him with horns. Well, it turns out that addition of horns comes from a mistranslation of the Bible. 
this is, a, I don't know if this is correct. This might be one of those standard, stupid, uh, skeptical things that turn out to be wrong. But from my understanding, it's a mistranslation that Moses doesn't have horns. It's supposed to be, and Moses is happy or something. And they were like, they switched some letters around as Moses has horns. And so that becomes literally set into stone that Moses has horns because of a mistranslation. So that's the corollary of this example that just completely blew my mind in the Western medical birthing process, which they think but they think giving birth is like the most risky procedure you can possibly undertake. And oh gosh, they got to intervene in all these ways. You want to tell them? Uh, yeah. So I've been doing a little bit of research into um, birth and children and of that nature, because, you know, one of the consequences of being so sick is that we've delayed having a family. I've been kind of baby crazy for many years now, and I cannot wait to expand our family, but we're just not healthy enough yet, but I'm looking forward to getting there. Um, but anyway, I've been doing research into this childbirth thing and um, came across some interesting stuff about placentas. And, um, and I had heard many women talk about, oh, delivering the placenta was the worst part. Um, your, even your mom had talked about that, you know, delivering the placenta. The placenta... It's um, dangerous. It might not come out. Yeah. Um, you know, might not come out, associated with hemorrhaging, a bunch of difficult things happening there. Um, so I thought, hmm, that's really interesting. You know, I don't feel like animals have as much trouble delivering their placentas or else, you know, that would be an issue all the time in mm. nature. So that doesn't make much sense to me. So what's going on it's a here? Weird system flaw with such an important process. Yeah. So um, did a little research and um, come to find out there's this thing that we do in the West called cord clamping. Um, so what they do is after a baby is born, what they will typically do is immediately clamp the cord while um, the baby has just come out and um, then wait for the placenta to be delivered through contractions. But a lot of the time this is an issue and the placenta doesn't come out very well and um, there's complications that arise from that. Um, come to find out that nature is so extremely intelligent and intricate that um, this placenta holds about a third of the baby's blood volume. And this is to help the baby pass through the vaginal canal, make it smaller. And then after the baby comes out through the umbilical cord, the placenta pulsates and empties the blood that's stored in it into the baby uh, with, his, with a bunch of stem cells and antibodies and all of that. And, um, and then as that happens, the placenta kind of shrinks and shrivels and then naturally pulls away from the uterus and is then delivered. Um, now, this happened very naturally up until a certain point when this invention was made, and this invention was the umbilical clamp. And now, oh, 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 can I interject here? Sure. Okay. So we've got the umbilical clamp, and um, apparently some of the story that's told about the umbilical clamp is it like, uh, I guess some nurses believe, or maybe the doctor believes, that you really got to make sure you clamp that umbilical cord quick, otherwise the blood may flow from the baby back into the mother. Right. That's the that's the story that they may give for yeah. why you have to make sure you clamp that umbilical cord. Right. Yeah. Well, anyway. So, um so this is this is the story, but anyway, this happened fairly naturally. Um what happened before this umbilical cord clamp is that the, you know, the placenta would pulsate, the um, blood would eventually run into the baby, the placenta would come out, they would um, cut the cord, and everybody would go on their merry way. So um, back when this was happening, um, bed sheets were white, and, and um, to preserve the linens, um, somebody came up with this invention of a cord clamp. And what this would do is this would clamp the cord after it had stopped pulsating, and the baby had received all the blood to just clamp it so no blood would kind of fall out after you cut it. So it would save the bed sheets from getting bloodied um, and make them easier to clean. Um, and this is um, kind of the, the purpose of the clamp to begin with. And in the patent for the clamp, 
it has listed there the you know the directions of use for the clamp and in the directions of the use for the clamp is after the placenta stops pulsating clamp and proceed to cut the cord so this this invention that we are all you know the what western medical community is using now to you know clamp this placenta and, and the cord and creates you know these unseen consequences of doing procedures like this you know you're messing with a very complex procedure that or a very complex natural um action that you that us as humans don't fully understand all the variables going into it unfortunately until after the fact usually when we intervene and where we don't think of the unintended consequences and then something goes wrong and somebody finally analyzes it from you know backwards and goes wait a minute you know something's wrong here yes so this this is just one more example and, and there's tons like this but this is i think one of the most clear examples of something that is that was not supposed to be practiced as it is today and results in um, problems. And childbirth in general is a whole list of things that you could go into that are problematic with the way that Western childbirth is practiced. Um, but that's just one of them. And it didn't even mention that uh, it makes sense that hemorrhaging is a problem when giving birth when you put the clamp on too soon. So <clears throat> you have doctors who, if you listen to the stories of these poor women. Yeah, if you go onto YouTube, you can hear a huge number of horror stories. They'll, they'll have the, the umbilical cord clamped for reasons that the doctor doesn't know why to preserve the bed sheets 100 years ago. Uh, they'll have the umbilical cord clamped. The placenta is still attached inside the mother because it's got a third of the baby's blood and a bunch of antibodies that it needs to pulse into the child. And then after it's done that, it'll come out. It, it can't do it because it's clamped. And then they start yanking on the cord. Well, Where some of them yank on the cord. Some of them manually they go in past your cervix and pull it off your uterus. Scrape it out of your uterus. And the thing is yeah. supposed to be attached there. So, yeah. I, I, it's just, it's the, an example of, the, of Moses having horns where it's like, it's a mistranslate. It's to save the bed sheets, and now it's become standard practice, and you're harming people. Like, it's just a, that's just one example among many. Yeah, and and it's a great invention for the use of of uh, you know not having any you know extra blood spillage, I suppose. Except in hindsight, the man has probably caused an untold I'm sure number he didn't of mean damage. To. I'm right? sure whoever you are who created the umbilical <laughs> clamp, I'm sure you did not intend for all of this to happen. Right. You are probably dead but right. I'm sorry. Right. So it's just a fundamental error and uh, lots more to say, lots more to talk about, but this has been quite a long uh, and good cathartic experience to, talk, to share this. And I hope you guys find our experiences helpful. If you've got a chronic illness that you can't figure out, you're not alone. There's actually a huge amount of people that are going through similar problems. They're also being failed by the same medical establishment, doesn't understand what the heck they're talking about, will dismiss you. Um, and it's scary. You're talking to, about, I was extremely skeptical getting into this alternative health community, still am, because there really is a lot of, I think there's a lot of nonsense. You gotta be super careful in listening to people, especially their theoretical claims about how the world works. But um, we have just empirically found in keeping an open mind we have had 10,000 times greater success going down this alternative health route in dealing with a thing called Lyme disease. That than is probably more complex than Lyme disease. It's but. more complex than that. Um, that has not even been diagnosed or even acknowledged after six years in, with over 50 doctors. Yeah, and, and I just want to add piggyback on to that, um, that throughout this process, I felt um, a lot of discouragement and um, felt like there wasn't a lot of hope left. And um, I would just encourage anybody who's dealing with a chronic health issue that you feel is not really being addressed at the fundamental level to, you know, go try an alternative doctor. Um, I would recommend specifically getting a f like an alternative MD because to me that signifies somebody that went 
with the mainstream medical establishment and was unsatisfied with their ability to help people. And that's right. the story I hear over and over and over again. So those are really not that if you, you know, there are tons of practitioners that are not MDs um, that haven't invested, you know, like eight years and, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, into um, this career path. But to me, that signifies like a, a really big dedication to helping people that there was there was this huge commitment that they made into their education, into their career, only to find out that when they got there, they couldn't help people as much as they wanted to, and they went into an alternative route, which yes. is inherently way more risky financially yep. and socially and a bunch yep. of other things. You could, And if depending on how you treat your patients, you could even get your license pulled. Right. Depending There's on, a, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a bunch of really crazy stuff, but I, you know, I, it, just as a word of advice for us, I think that was the best decision that we made was going to see an, uh, you know, alternative in quotation marks, um, MD, um, and I will say, and I don't want to tell you that, oh, the first MD you see, the alternative MD you see is going to be the one. I would say, you know, try to do your research beforehand. A lot of the initial appointments are long and expensive and the treatments are long and expensive and usually not covered by insurance. Um, but when you've been as unhealthy as we have for as long as we have, you know, we'd probably cut off an arm, you know, we definitely would no cut doubt. off an arm. Yeah. So, um, I would say it's worth the investment. I know, I, I know a lot of people are struggling and there's a lot of people in my life that I know, um, that are struggling and I'm kind of conflicted on, you know, what to tell them or, you know, it, I feel kind of morally obligated to at least try to say something, but it's also kind of arrogant. I, I feel in some sense to try to say, I bet you're not getting the help that you actually need. Right. I feel like it's arrogant and I, but at the same time, I, I feel like, okay, if they think I'm arrogant, that's okay, but I just want to try and try. Well, especially when there's mal malpractice being uh, had on you know, people you love and you care about. Like, yeah. you know, there you, you might end up losing organs that you otherwise need because you're listening to the stories of people with, with white coats on that yeah. actually don't know what the heck they're talking about. So that's, it's hard to look at that and be outside of it now after being in it way too long, uh, but looking at it from the outside and going, oh my gosh, what? A, this is just a scandal. And it, and the, the thing is, it's not just purely intellectual. It really deeply affects people's lives. Yeah. And it affects their, because it affects their lives, it affects their kids' lives, the people around them. You know, yeah. health is just such a big deal. I mean, and, and also just try to think about things kind of, um, for me, I always kind of go back to like, should this be the case? So like, should it be the case that, you know, it seems ubiquitous across developed nations that people are having less sex? And should it be the case that people are, you know, having more infertility, more degenerative diseases, more of all these different things? Cancer, more autism. Yeah, yeah, should that be the case? And if, you can't really reconcile that in your brain, which it didn't reconcile for me. Maybe it's time to go see somebody who has some answers on a more fundamental reason of why these things are happening. So that's just what I would say. Great note to end on, darling. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Hope you found that helpful. All right. All right.